Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for The Boys, Season 2, Episode 7, Butcher Baker, Candlestick Maker. This video is part of a series of videos where I review episodes of The Boys, so I have to start with a spoiler warning for The Boys, up to Season 2, Episode 7. If you haven't seen up to this point, you will not want to watch this video, otherwise some things will be spoiled for you. So this was a pretty good episode. I would say for most of the episodes, kind of a setup character building episode, but then we got some pretty powerful stuff towards the end of this episode here that I think is mainly setting up for a huge finale, but maybe I'm wrong about that, but it certainly seems that way. Uh, so it's some pretty shocking stuff, some pretty shocking revelations in this episode, so it was overall a really good episode. Um, I think this is... I you typically try to avoid politics when I'm doing my reviews of, of TV shows and stuff like that, but when they're show I'm reviewing is very overtly political, then I don't see any point in avoiding it. I mean, you might as well just write out and say it that this, uh, particularly that opening scene, that was actually really powerful. And that sort of, of course, had implications in, uh, you know, our real life contemporary world, uh, not just this fictional world. I mean, the comparison that they're making is beyond obvious that it is really a scathing um attack or at least commentary against these alt-right uh extremist groups and also propaganda particularly they had vault news which is obviously a stand-in for fox news and um you know, they had uh, Alex Jones likes, you know, <laughs> characters meant to be like them. It was pretty uh, obvious. And, of course, the way that Homelander and Stormfront are talking is the exact same way that Trump and other prominent right-wing uh, politicians talk. That they rile people up and cause violence. <laughs> I think the commentary this episode was making is crystal clear. Now, and I for the record of course 100% agree with it and I actually really loved it in fact I almost thought that that opening sequence that had the I love the opening sequence and I thought it maybe hit a bit too close to home like it was probably one of the more like realistic uh portrayals that the show was have and made made me think of that it just just wasn't talking about like a fictional show about you know a regular guy who is nothing wrong with it he loves his mother he's a he's a good guy at heart but he keeps is being indoctrinated by this constant stream of propaganda that is, that's making him afraid and he eventually succumbs to, to that fear and kills an innocent man because of it and i think that is yeah that almost that hits really that's it's such a realistic chord that I almost found it too disturbing. Um, and that's, I mean, and I'm talking about the boys here, which has had a lot of disturbing stuff. But this is probably, for me, it was probably the most just because of how realistic it was. Like when people's, for example, when people's heads explode in a court hearing, that's maybe not as disturbing because that is very recognizable as a fantasy. Like, the, that doesn't happen in real life. But stuff, that opening sequence is maybe a bit too realistic. But anyway, um, so yeah, so I found that bit disturbing. I, I love the commentary, but at the same time I had this kind of... Maybe they were a bit too realistic on that one. But then the show um, moved on and we focused on our separate storylines. We had Homelander and Stormfront uh, sort of manipulate um, um, Homelander's son. Uh, and, uh, you know, try and eventually they turned him against Becca and basically stole him away so that was that, that was actually quite powerful and it makes all the sense in the world that stormfront whole thing is like wanting to get more um you know soups and to find out that the that homelander has a son who's actually naturally born with superpowers it's, i didn't realize that that's true it's actually a game changer and of course don't stormfront would be absolutely 
um, interested in that. Now, I don't think realistically that um, Stormfront and Homelander's hold on the boy will last because he, you know, his mother is all he's ever known. Now, of course, he, he has that initial shock of feeling betrayed and like he can't trust her anymore because uh, Homelander revealed uh, that everything he thought he knew was a lie. I mean, that is quite a shocking revelation, but I think eventually the anger over that will wear off and he'll want his mother back, but we'll see. Uh, maybe not. Um, we also had a storyline with uh, um, Bully Butcher and his family, and I gotta be honest, I'm really not interested in this. Like, when they mention... When they, he, Billy Butcher, visited his aunt in a couple weeks ago, and they mentioned that he had a younger brother that reminded them of Huey. Like, I didn't mention that in my review because I'm not interested in it. I really don't care. And, and so they go into it deeper and find out that he shot himself because their father was verbally abusive, I think possibly even physically abusive. And um, the guy, you know, he was played by John Noble, really great actor, was in Fringe and Lord of the Rings. Um, and he, it's funny to have an Australian and New Zealander, they're both playing British people, but whatever. But anyway, um, so their, um, yeah, their whole exchange and Billy Butcher, like, I don't really need Billy Butcher's backstory or motivation for who he is or why he is the way he is. I think... That's kind of obvious. I don't know. I just I just didn't really find any. Every time they went back to the storyline, I was like, oh, can we get through this and get back to the other stuff? I don't know. That's just me personally. And also, like, so they had the whole thing of their teaming up with uh, the congresswoman, uh, Newman, I think her name is, who's another very obvious stand-in for uh, the real-life politician uh, AOC. And, of course, the way they had the chance... The you know protesters tend to send her back. Of course, is based off of real life. That that wasn't to AOC. It was one of her colleagues, uh, oh, uh, Congressman Omar, who Trump and other Trump supporters and would uh, say send her back, which is the most racist, ridiculous thing. And so, so as I said, the 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 politics of this sh show is blatant and obvious. So, I mean, if you're against it, the like. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. It's pretty obvious. But anyway, um, so I like that too. I like the interactions uh, between um, um, Frenchie and Kimiko. This the relationship went pretty much the direction I, you know, everyone knew it would, where she ended up uh, teaching him uh, her sign language. But I liked it. I think that's exactly what needed to happen. I think it was well earned, and I think I think it was a nice character moment. And I would like to see these characters progress even further. So I I think they're doing a really good job developing them. Um, and then you had uh, the whole thing with Mother's Milk, and um, God, I keep, I need to learn her name. The um, that CIA lady. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, they're. It was interesting where she offered him uh, to be with his family and he turned her down. And I think that's actually, I don't know if that fits for his character. I mean, I suppose you could try to cram it into his character and say that he's really invested in his, uh, his deceased father's calls. But it does, and maybe he never really wanted to be with his family and he was just pretending that. But it does seem like... Um, Grace Malloy, thank you, that's her name. And anyway, uh, it does seem like when Malloy offered him uh, a way out that really he should have taken it, and it feels like the reason why he didn't is mainly for story purposes, because they, he needs to be in the show. <laughs> um, uh, but that's just what I thought. And, and so the whole thing about trying to convince the doctor guy to testify, like, I wasn't really interested in that, and then... And when Billy Butcher showed up, showed up and just like, I'm going to kill all your family if you don't testify. Like, I don't know. Something about that didn't sit right to me. Not that Billy Butcher is threatening to kill innocent people. I mean, I wouldn't put it up past him. I think that's totally within his character. But just that that's how they got him. Uh, was it Vogelbaum? Yeah, that's how they got Vogelbaum to testify. Just by threatening his family. I don't know. 
it, uh, it seems like that that he wouldn't really do it then because he knew <laughs> that Vought would be a bigger threat to his family. It's not that I think it's immoral and I have issues with him doing it. I just don't buy that that would cause him to actually cooperate. I don't know. That's just me, but it's no big deal, really. Um, and so we got the whole storyline <laughs> with um, Lampladder and Huey which I thought was, you know, with Lamplighter just wanting to sit around and watch porn all day, which was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> and it shows how fucked up he is, but of course he is really depressed as we see he's suicidal because he commits suicide. And uh, he agrees with Huey to help him break in to a vault building. Now, I will mention what my biggest issue with this episode is, and I think it is... <laughs> plot convenience to why Huey didn't con uh, contact Butcher to help him because first of all the excuse they gave in the episode is Huey tried to call him but Butcher had his phone turned off and wasn't answering and he's like oh I can't get a hold of him so I guess you'll have to help me but then why doesn't he try calling him again and again and again and again why doesn't he try calling him later we see that Billy Butcher picks up the phone to speak to uh, Mother's Milk so Pretty much like um, you can determine that if he would called him later, he would have picked up. At the very least, he could have told him what he was up to. So I don't know. It seemed like plot convenience because they just wanted Billy Butcher. Yeah, I'm not Billy Butcher, sorry. They just wanted Huey and Lamplighter uh, to break in without Billy Butcher. So that seemed like a bit of plot convenience to me. Um, but then. Um, the storyline when they did i think it made all the sense in the world that lamplighter just was using this as an excuse so he could commit suicide in front of his statue and he was like really pissed off when they found out they actually removed the statue uh so he just committed suicide anyway leaving huey pretty screwed but thankfully that set off the fire alarms which gave uh, starlight the means uh, to escape anyway um, and then you had that really awesome uh, fight between um, Black Noir and uh, Starlight. Now, I kind of knew that they wouldn't kill off Starlight, but I didn't know who exactly would come to her rescue. Um, so it's very interesting that it ended up being Queen Maeve. Um, she had a little storyline this episode with that continue on with her girlfriend Elena leaving her because of um, finding out what happened with the airplane and uh just i think that elena she didn't quite i don't think she blamed queen Maeve per se for what happened with the plane because she said she knew that uh that because she acknowledges that she couldn't do anything to stop it and that that must have been really damaging to her but i think it's all too much like elena was not aware of all the shit that was going on and it's just too much for her to handle and so Queen Maid gets depressed herself and starts, you know, sleeping around as the threesome with two guys, which pisses off Ashley because it's off-brand. I kind of like that. That was cool, but it shows her state of mind. And so it's pretty interesting that she actually saved Starlight because I'm trying to think what motivation she has. And I think mainly it gets down to the fact that she sees herself, a young, younger, and innocent, more innocent version of herself in starlight and doesn't want her to become like her so doesn't want her to be corrupt or whatever or in this case die <laughs> um by the seven and she's kind of sick of their bullshit now here's a huge question i have though and this is something i, I have hasn't been answered i was looking for this answer so i think people just don't know the answer yet is black noir dead because if the answer is no, then Queen Maeve is in trouble. Uh, then maybe she could become dead if he's not. So either way, this is going to really, really shake up the seven. Um, and I also thought the scene where they pulled up his mask was pretty interesting. I think I had read, a, accidentally heard a spoiler about uh, Black Noir's identity from the comics. And it does from this scene seem like... Uh, that the show is going in a different direction and not the same direction. It seems like the show is only very loosely based off the comics anyway. And so I actually hope that is true, that the show is actually going in a different direction as far as Black Noir's uh, identity goes. Now, 
Um, yeah, <laughs> so this really shakes things up where Starlight is now with the boys. And in fact, her mother's with the boys and she's excommunicated because Homelander outright said in public that she's a traitor. Uh, so this really changes the dynamic and I think a really good way. I'm really interested to see what happens next. And of course, the huge play to outvault in the, um, the whole Congress meeting doesn't work because everyone's head explodes. Now, <laughs> that scene was so typical of the boys. Of course, it was really shocking. Some people are calling it, um, what are they calling it? The, the red hearing <laughs> instead of the red wedding. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, <laughs> that was quite out there. Uh, one of the more shocking things to show that and it's interesting that congressman woman newman survived because it, realistically if the target was to t to stop them from investigating the vault that she would be a prime target um but anyway uh, <laughs> so i've heard some theories about who was responsible for the heads exploding and it seems like the most common theory i've heard on the internet over and over again is that it was cindy now, Cindy was the soup we saw at the Shady Grove Mental Institution in the previous episode who uh, could explode people just with her thoughts. She just, like, clasped her hands and someone would explode. Um, I'm actually very much against that theory. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, I have several reasons for that. Uh, first of all, and this is a slight thing, and this, and you know, I could be wrong. I'm not saying this is definitely the case. I mean, maybe it is her, but I really, if I were a betting man, I would highly bet against it. Because here's the thing, and this is a small thing, but when Cindy exploded people, she exploded the whole body, not just the head. Now, this, the thing with the head is consistent with who we saw. Uh, when we saw the CIA agent in the first episode of season two, her head exploded. And here we have other people's. It's just their heads. Like the, all the people who die at this hearing, it's just their heads that explode. Whereas in the past, within the previous episode where we saw Cindy, every time she killed someone, their entire body explode. Now that's that's a small thing, but I think that's actually telling. And also. Like, the theory that it is Cindy who is doing this uh, goes that uh, Stormfront kind of manipulated her, brainwashed her into um, killing the CIA agent and using it for her purposes. Um, but at the last week's episode, we saw Cindy was hitchhiking and that she actually has a huge uh, gripe against Vault and Stormfront that if maybe in the past Stormfront manipulated her into working for her but now it's very clear that she hates a Vault and is actually has a sort of vengeance a revenge path against them so why would she go to this, this meeting and kill all these people which only purpose is to help Vault I mean, I guess the theory goes further that Stormfront perhaps captured her again or somehow manipulated her into doing it again, but I don't buy it. Uh, that seems like a, a bit of a stretch to me. Again, I could be wrong, but I really, really, really don't think that it's Cindy. I think who it is is a soup that we have yet to meet that has different powers that has to do with just the heads exploding. In fact, I think it maybe could not be a soup at all. That maybe is actually a piece of technology that someone is using to explode people's heads. So who do I think, whether it's a soup or a piece of technology, a soup we haven't met yet, or a piece of technology, who do I think is ultimately controlling that? Who do I think actually killed all the people at the Congress meeting? Would you like a fresca? <laughs> I think it's the Church of the Collective. That is my theory. I'm throwing that out there. I think it, a lot of people think it's Stormfront or that it's Edgar's or it's Vault. I actually think it's a Church of the Collective. And here's my reasoning for, for that. My main reasoning for that is who is one of the people that died? Shockwave. A-Train's replacement on the 7th. Now, if this was Vault, or if this was Stormfront, why would they kill Shockwave, a member of the 7 who is towing the party line, who, by all purposes, 
is useful to them why would they kill shockwave now i guess you could say oh maybe they didn't mean to it just happened by accident but we see other members of the seven like queen mave and um homelander and stormfront they didn't get killed so i don't think it's a coincidence i think it's the church of the, the collective because they want to get rid of shockwave because the a train is one of their men now and they want to put a train back in the seven that's been very clear so <laughs> i think it's them and so I think because they also don't want Vault to lose because they want to the Seven to remain because they want to control them. So they're also going to help them out by killing the CIA agent who is trying to, to tattle on them to the boys. Yet the Church of the Collective don't necessarily have anything against the boys themselves. They just want to stop this, you know, sort of information of getting out. So, because if it was Ed Gorses or Stormfront who killed the CIA agent in episode one, why stop there? Why not just kill all of the boys? That's something a lot of people are pointing out. Why did they let the boys live and just kill the CIA agent? I think it's because it's a church of collective and they don't really have any gripe against the boys. They just want to stop uh, that whole thing about, you know, a vault going down they just don't want the vault to go down um so they just kill people who directly try to speak up against them and so that's why they, they killed the, the congressman and they killed the the good doctor what's his name Vogelbaum, who was about to testify and then they started killing some more random people around <laughs> just to create chaos but i don't think shockwave was a random person i think that was deliberately targeted so that they could put a train back into the seven so they could have their agent back in there want a fresca <laughs> i'm sure all right so we'll we'll see though we'll see where it goes but i i'm still sticking by that is definitely not cindy anyway um <laughs> And it's also speaking of the Church's Collective that it was an interesting storyline. Uh, I'm actually no longer going to complain about the Deep. I actually I totally like where they're going here now. And it was an interesting storyline. It was really funny too, where uh, that the uh, director of the Collective, um, whatever the hell his name is, Alistar Donna. Anyway, that he goes up. He's like, "What do you think of?" Um, was it Eagle the Archer and Deep's like, oh, he's a great guy. He loved it. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be. And he's like, he's been excommunicated. He's like, oh, yeah, no, he's a very like, toxic. I can totally see that. <laughs> that was really funny. And A Train, to his credit, is is not kind of buying it. You could tell that he is seeing is like, he even confronts Deep about it. He's like, wasn't, didn't, wasn't he your friend? And he's like, oh, yeah, that was before. <laughs> and so I, you do get the strong sense that A-Train isn't, he can see through the Church of Collectors bullshit. The Deep is an idiot. He's completely bought into it. He'll climb the sinker. But A-Train is going along with it for now, but you can tell that he's not, he can see what the fuck they're up to. He can see that they're evil. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how reliable he's going to be as an agent for them. Um, yeah, but I'm convinced of the ones that did. But we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll just see about that. Anyway, my rating uh, for Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker. Uh, out of 10, I'm going to give this an 8. Uh, extremely good. It was a really good episode. A lot of character building. The Billy Butcher stuff I wasn't a huge fan of, and the whole thing of trying to get Volgamon to testify wasn't a huge fan of that either. Uh, but it was interesting seeing the Homelander and Stormfront steal uh, their, you know, Becca's baby uh, away from the her. And it was interesting, of course, the whole Starlight thing. And uh, the ending, of course, was mind blowing. Get it? Anyway. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this, please. Uh, be sure to leave a like and subscribe and all that sort of jazz. And if you did enjoy this uh, video, please check out my channel as I cover many other shows uh, such as Lower Decks, as Star Trek, Bojack Horseman, The Expanse, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.